good evening, everyone. This is Chrissy McMahon, and you're listening to Alchemical Connections on Awake Radio. And we have our very, very special guest, Josh Reeves, uh, straight from Dallas, Texas. He actually just got done another interview, so <laughs> we're, we're not going to try to expend him too much, but uh, we'll try to get as much information as we can out of him. And I already did your introduction, so um, maybe you'd just like to come on and say hello to our listeners. Thank you, Josh, for being here. Oh, well, awesome. It's great to be here, Chrissy, and uh, thanks for having me on the show, and I'm, I'm excited to get into uh, uh, whatever you'd like to talk about and, and, and just uh, get into a, a discussion. You know, I, I, get, I get into so many different things, and I do so many different topics of research and areas that uh, it's, uh, it's one of those things where it's always been enjoyable for me to, to look into all the different aspects of, of research and knowledge and everything else, but then, uh, you know, as you get older and you start learning more and more and then you find out that all these things that you never thought really all connected together really do all connect together so uh it's an awesome journey and i hope that uh your listeners out there are on that sort of path in their own unique way as well absolutely um (laughs) we're awake radio (laughs) we're trying to uh not only awaken people but um bring more information to those who are already awake and aware right and um my format is usually um, I've been very fortunate to have some wonderful, wonderful guests who are just uh, a, a plethora of information. And uh, one of the things that I really wanted to find out was about your new film. But um, I'm interested in anything you want to share. Uh, I know that you're involved in so many wonderful projects. And I recently just realized, and I know I heard one before, that you actually read books and make podcasts out of them. And I mean, that's like the, the least of what you do, but um, you can talk about all the wonderful films and other documentaries that you've uh, created and anything else you'd like to, and please share about your website and any other projects that um, that you feel, you know, that you'd like to share about. So thank you again, Josh. Awesome. Yeah, it, it's going to be uh it's gonna be a lot of fun here. Uh, did you uh, did you want to talk about um, the new film first? Did you want me to sort of get into some of that, or where would you like to start? Well, um, j- just as an uh, an introduction, maybe you could just uh, beyond the bio, what we uh, have discussed, you can just share maybe briefly how you got into this field. Um, I mean, I know it's all on your website and it's in a in your different podcasts, but uh, maybe you could give us the skinny on how you. Uh, became enlightened and and moved into this genre of filmmaking and alternative media producing and then uh then we can talk about your different films and lead up to what you're doing now (laughs) well absolutely and and you know i think for for myself and i know uh, as for everybody else up there as well knows this as you mentioned you know being uh you become awake and aware to the all of this stuff the the thing about it is everybody out there is is at a different level uh, at this, you know, everybody's at a different stage in their enlightenment and in their journey and their understanding Absolutely. of this. And oftentimes, when people get get into arguments over information or get into arguments over, you know, the finer points of this or that, it, it really doesn't come from the fact most of the time that either one of these people are necessarily right or wrong. It comes strictly from the standpoint of the fact that everybody is just at a different level of this. So. Um, where I come from, where I where I stand on this is uh, where I'm at, is just a different level than where other people are at, and there are other people that are at higher levels than me, and I may be at a higher level than other people, but I'm also at a lower level than other people. But it's just this understanding that it's a constant evolution, and that is when you think you know everything there is to know, you're just deluding yourself. You're, you know, there's always. I mean, I, I know way more than I did when I first started doing my radio show six years ago, and I thought I knew everything there was to know. <laughs> and, you know, when you get in a position, Chrissy, where, as you know, from doing a show and, and having to sort of, you know, always have new material and new stuff going, it, you know, it's a good thing because it does not allow you to get lazy. It doesn't allow you to sit on your laurels. It puts you in a position where you constantly have to be doing your research, doing your homework, and, and learning more in order to bring that to your audience. And so <clears throat> for me, this whole process, my whole entire life of waking up to this stuff is really has been a lifelong process. And it's just been one of those things that's gradually happened in stages through different levels or different periods. And it's an evolution and where I'm at now and making films and doing radio show and, and now doing live presentations on a lot of this stuff that I talk about in the new film, Lost Secrets of Ancient America. 
Um, it's, you know, it's a place, I'm at a place now doing this and just have been on Coast to Coast AM and in May. I mean, this is, this is just wow. a huge thing for me. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is something that, uh, you know, I worked years and years to achieve and two or three years ago, all the stuff I'm doing now was a pipe dream and it's here. <laughs> and that just comes as a result of just not giving up and not stopping and continuing to search for that greater context and that greater truth. So when I was a kid, I started out, you know, studying UFOs and stuff when I was in elementary school and got into uh, Kennedy assassination stuff when I was in high school. And then, you know, gradually into adulthood, you know, I, I went out and which is always new from the time when I was in high school that, that, you know, the world was not what they were teaching us. I knew that this was just, you know, enslavement. I knew the two party system, even before I was old enough to register to vote, I knew the two party system was a fraud. I mean, it was just a constant re revolution and, and evolution for me. And then uh, when 9-11 happened at that time, I had, I had a pretty good job working for, for in the tech industry. 9-11 happened, my job got shipped off to India and I was kind of back at square one as I was, you know, back at the time when I was in high school and stuff. So I just said, enough is enough. You know, I've got to start putting my talents and, and what I know how to do towards trying to not only find the truth, but also find a way to get that truth out there to people. So I started doing, uh, passing out DVDs in the streets and just, you know, doing uh, real, you know, in the street protest stuff in 2005, 2006. And then uh, around 2007, I made my first film, 9-11 New World Rising. And at that point, I started realizing that I had to find a way to reach more people than just being in the streets. Yeah. So um, that was what led me to starting my radio show and um, to also to where I'm at now, making this film on the, the Rockwall and Rockwall Texas and the other lost secrets of ancient America. And so I'm, I'm working on volume two right now. And uh, it's it, again, it's just a constant evolution. And it's a thing where if you stay on top of the a desire to know more, the universe will respond. And, and, and it does, it does bring those, that information to you when you truly want it for the right reasons. Absolutely. And I just want to interject a little bit. Um, what I wanted to say from the beginning, we have people, um, that are listening tonight that have been waiting all day to listen to you. So I just wanted you to know that, um, you have a, you have a great following that people are interested in the information that you're sharing and that, um, we're just grateful that you are here to share it with us tonight so i just want to say thank you again oh thank that's you, yeah no it's, it's it's my pleasure to be here i uh it, it's the thing for me where it, it's not even you know it's doing a show or something like this is really not for some people it's a chore for me it's not a chore because it's just uh, you know it's what i do i mean I'm, you know every second of my day i don't have a really <laughs> a, a life outside of this i mean it's seven days a week for me I'm, I'm constantly doing something either working on the films or researching for the films or sending out DVDs or, you know, whatever it may be. But um, as I said, I think that, that it all comes down to a decision. And I think that a lot of people out there um, think they want the truth, you know, and they will, they mean well, but um, it, it comes down to a point in, in your life where you kind of have to decide that, you know, you just want to put all on the line and dedicate yourself to finding it. So I think that, that um, all those people out there who, listen to shows like yours and shows like mine. I, I think that's one of the things that they have to, uh, I hope that they're grateful for, you know, for, for what we do in this, because it is something where we are providing a service to people and, and really exponentiating how much you can know in a short amount of time. I mean, you know, I, I never claim that I have all the answers or that I, I can give anybody all the answers, but if you take the things that you hear me talk about in my films and on my radio show, and you go and look into that stuff on your own and really start to get, gain an understanding of it on your own, not just looking into it on your own, but gaining an understanding for it, you will start to see revelations in places and things you never thought they were to be possible because, you know, that's, that's really what all this is for. You know, I was inspired by other people who did it before me, and my job really is to just try to do as much as I can for truth while I'm here and able to do it, and hopefully that inspires other people. That's really where I come from. Absolutely, and that's wonderful, and, uh, and it's funny – because uh, I've been in this since 2003, 2006. It's kind of the the, the matrix that I came from with the 9-11. And that was my whole inspiration. It was nobody wanted to listen to me, so I didn't have a way <laughs> to give this information. And I then found my way to Block Talk Radio. And then now I've uh, migrated here to Awake Radio, and I'm just so happy. And uh, we roar. And it, it's a little community we're building here. And it's just awesome that... Um, 
the years that it's taken us to get to the point where we're at or with our understanding of things and we're able to share that with everybody and not that everybody's on the same page I loved how you said that in the beginning but um, we have so many people willing and wanting to hear this stuff and wanting to understand so it's a great time it's a wonderful time to be alive and I just appreciate it thank you absolutely well um, let's see what, what uh what, what would you like to get into the next, Chrissy? I'm, I'm open to talk about whatever you want to talk about. I know. About. You just got done an interview, so you're probably talked a little no, bit. No, no, no. I'm, I'm good to go. Let's, let, let's oh, do this. Excellent. I'm ready to okay, go. Okay, well, let's talk about your first documentary in 2007. Um, I kind of put my cheat sheet down. So that would be um, The Secret Right Now. 9-11 um, New, New World Rising. 9-11 New World Rising. That's, I think, where we all started from. So um for me um i was just devastated that we went to war and it seemed like to be the only person around me i lived in the mountains at the time and they were all really like pro-war and they just thought it was amazing and, and we had some people that were arab that were working in the place where i worked at and they were you know i think if uh, the fbi or the cia or whoever came they would have like drove them to these people's houses to turn them over it was just like a really unbelievable time and I didn't understand the dynamics of everything that was going on but I knew in my heart that this there's just so many inconsistencies it was just a horrible horrible time so here we are 2007 you made a do your first documentary new world 9-11 new world rising so maybe you just want to give us a little brief um, introduction into that film absolutely and that was you know for how that started for me was it originally that film wasn't going to be a 9-11 film at all was actually going to be a, a film on uh, secret societies and stuff of that nature. And during the course of while I was working on that film, I started noticing that there were, um, you know, there were a lot of 9-11 films starting to come out around that time. And I, I started noticing that, that a lot of them didn't have certain pieces of information in there that I thought they should. And, and at the time, you know, I didn't really think that maybe that was a part of some larger agenda to keep the truth hidden. I think certainly now I, I think that's the truth. But um, at the time, I just thought it was okay. You know, was th these guys just missed this stuff or whatever it was. So my, I started noticing that, well, I've got all this 9-11 stuff. There's all of this information that nobody seems to want to put out or, or even mention. Uh, up until that time, there's, you know, there was a, there were quite a few things in that film that up until that time were not really heavily mentioned in uh, the field of 9-11 truth research, but they are now. So mm -hmm. it kind of, so the film kind of seems dated when you watch it now because it kind of seems, some of the stuff in there just seems like uh, uh, everyday stuff you know now. But at the time when, the, when that film was released, it was not. And it took a lot of people uh, catching up to that film to get a lot of that stuff brought into the, to the, uh, the mix later on. But there's a lot of inter interesting footage in that film. It's up for free on YouTube. People can watch it. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of interesting angles and shots in there of... Uh, of different things, I tried to 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 come at it from the standpoint of not having a um, pre-decided opinion on how the how, why, who, and all that. I really just, with that film wanted to just show people the strange evidence and have them decide for themselves. And so I had people, you know, who watched that film, who believed that I was, um, you know, supporting the no plane theory and i had people who believed i was supporting this other theory and, and that was the thing and, and i think that's i think that's good i think that's okay because what that means is that people were taking away from it what they saw from it not from what i was trying to get them to believe it was and i think that's something else that is missing in a lot of films in and i really am always kind of suspect of that and i definitely don't do that with my documentaries i don't try to i try to not uh. come to conclusions for you I, I i try to allow you to come to your own conclusions based on the data and the information that i present in these films and i think that's a, a lot better of a way to do it because the mark of journalism that's absolutely the way you're supposed it's to missing it. yeah i mean we, we we don't we don't get that anymore we you know everything you watch on tv television documentaries even independent documentaries they all seem to be coming from a, a, a standpoint of a conclusion and agenda that's, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's already been, you know, they, they already come from a, a a ending that they've already decided, like this show that comes on the History Channel now, the uh, America on Earth, they do the same thing there. They already have a pre-decided um, explanation for what it is they claim they're going to uncover an hour before they ever start the hour-long show, you know, right. and so they just work backwards from this premise that's already set instead of saying, 
here's the information, here's the data, what do you think it is based on this? And that really comes into play um, in all of my films and comes into play even more in the newest one, The Lost Secrets of Ancient America. But um, 9-11 Year Old Rising, none of the other films I made after that could have happened without that one. That was the one that put me on the map, got me a radio show, and uh, yeah, that's where that's where it all began. That's awesome. And, um, and it's important, too, that even what it's uh, over 11 and it's 12 years now since 9-11 um, happened and we're still finding out things you know uh, it's just wonderful you can go back and watch all the different documentaries that have been made and there's hundreds of them now and you can glean new information because we can't possibly uh, you know keep all that information in our head and at the same time moving into the esoteric and the occult I mean, that just, you know, what you're saying about the secret societies and everything. So that's probably the secret right <laughs> volume one. That would be your your uh, next uh, project. Yeah. And how I got into that was was, a compl was another. It was just a complete accident. I 9-11 uh, Year World Rising had been out maybe a few weeks. I mean, really not even that long at all. Not even no, maybe a week or two. And um, I had at the time I'd been going on some radio shows. Uh, that some friends of mine had been doing, and and uh, this guy who was running the radio network asked me to do a show there. So I started doing my show, and at first it was just an hour, uh, hour long show Monday through Thursday. But the second show I ever did, we had an event here in Dallas when we uh, premiered 9/11 New World Rising, and we had uh, William Rodriguez come out to the event wow. and uh, and do a speech and stuff. And he watched my film, and I was his personal cameraman all day and stuff. It was a it was a pretty cool time, and. Uh, Originally, though, we had been, we were going to have uh, Professor Peter Dell Scott come to this thing, and he couldn't make it at the time. And uh, the the second day that I did my radio show, uh, Peter Dell Scott sent me a message and said, "Hey, do you still want me to come to your event in Dallas?" And I said, "No, you know, it's over. I mean, you know, it already happened. Sorry." I said, "But uh, hey, I you know I just started a radio show and I need a guest. You know, <laughs> would you like to come on and be my first guest?" And I didn't dream he'd say yes, and he did. So here I was on my second show I'd ever done. I mean, I was totally green, wet behind the ears, didn't have a radio voice. I didn't really have any business being on radio at that point, other than the fact that I, I, I knew a little bit of stuff. And um, we, you know, here, here I am. I've got former Canadian diplomat Peter Del Scott. So, you know, we start getting into it and I start talking about the usual milk toasty conspiracy stuff. I start talking about, you know, CFR and trilateral commission. And all of a sudden in the middle of this, he says, Well, those groups really aren't as powerful anymore as people say they are. And and in this, that, and the other, and um, re really, what you need to look into is another group that really is more powerful than them, and they're called the, the CMP, the Council for National Policy, and um, they were based in, they were started in Dallas, and and all this stuff, and I was like, what? You know, I'd never heard of this. So o over the weekend, that was uh, at the end of the week, and over the weekend, I, I was started looking at this Council for National Policy stuff, and synchronistically, the same day I started researching it, there was a news story that came out. It said, Vice President Dick Cheney attends secretive right-wing group meeting in Utah, the Council for National Policy. And I said, what are the odds? You know, what are the odds that I would just find out about this group? And here it is, you know, I was looking uh, high and low to see if there's anything in the news on these guys, and there wasn't. And then today, they had a meeting this weekend. And as I started looking, I started noticing that all of these um, – all of these – people that were members or past members of the group, the current membership lists are not made available, but the older ones are, and they're very secretive. They don't allow anyone to know who's in the group or where they meet or when they meet. They're way more secretive than the Bilderberg group or any of these other groups. And um, I started noticing that a high percentage of current and former members were all major guests on, you know, conspiracy and truth or talk radio. And that became a huge red flag for me. I started saying, why, why is, you know, why are there 15 people here who are part of this secretive group that we never hear about talking to the conspiracy genre? 15 of these people are reg regular guests on the Alex Jones show. Something is up here. So that's when I started going, you know, this is, I, what did I, what did I get into here? You know, cause I was yeah. all gung ho truth movement, Mr. You know, I was, I was all into all that stuff. And all of a sudden within a week of starting this radio show, I have my paradigm complete again, yet again, completely shifted, turned around, um, and I start finding. I mean, these guys are, you know, funded by the Rothschilds. They're they have uh, they're, they're connected to the Vatican, the Knights of Malta. They're connected to the CIA. I mean, they're, they're connected to everything. People can watch my Secret Right one and two films on uh, YouTube for free as well, and uh, you can also get DVDs and stuff on my website. But um, 
it, it's just, it was a fascinating study, and I, I made two films on it and spent about four or five years uh, exposing that stuff and getting into it because um, there had been some people who had done some research on that prior to me getting into it. But really, there, there, nobody had ever made a film on it, so I made the first film on the Council for National Policy, first two films. No one had really done that. And, um, you know, all the while, in the back of my head, I, I going back to 2004, when I was reading Jim Marr's book, Rule by Secrecy, I still had this thing about this rock wall in my head. And I, I wanted to get something going on that, but um, I was pretty inexperienced at making films. And so I had to get that CMP and secret right information out. And th so I could then have the experience to do this rock wall project. And so after the Lost Secrets of Ancient, I'm sorry, after uh, the Secret Right Volume 2 came out, that film ends um, with a mention of the rock wall and shows it there. And I talk about that being the next project. And so when I got into that, I really was excited because I was like, okay, you know, I've done, I did the 9 11 thing, I did the secret societies and the CMP secret right stuff. Now, you know, we're going to get into this rock wall thing and this is going to be completely different than all the other stuff, you know, that I've talked about to this point. This is going to be, you know, totally left field. We're not going to be, you know, it's not going to have anything to do with these secretive groups or anything else. Boy, was I wrong. Boy, was I ever wrong. Uh, and, and, and it's just amazing because all of that stuff, all, and little did I know, all the research and all of the reading and stuff I've done all these years uh, up to this point, it all has come into play with this current project in ways that I never thought it would because I originally, as I said, just set out to make a film about this rock wall thing and then started researching and trying to find precedents for this in other places in the United States. And it just has now become this um, complete unraveling of the true history and origins of mankind itself and that's really no less than what it is absolutely i mean, I mean it just takes you in so many different directions <laughs> it's it's mind-boggling and when you first get on this path you can i believe people can lose their mind yeah because um you know it takes you into aspects of religion um not just politics uh, not just finance but the occult and you know it, it, and if you don't you know if you jump into this, you have to have a really strong constitution to know that whatever you're looking at, you know, you have to be, be able to be open-minded to it and not uh, a fixate on any one issue or topic because once you do that, you really can get lost. This can, like, take you instead of you, you know, working it and trying to get glean as much information as you can out of it. So that's my, my biggest thing in how you present the information. I think that's so important that we do it with love and we do it with the open mind and we do it without an agenda. So, I, I, you know, I just uh, applaud you for the, for the great mind that you had going into this and, and what you've been able to accomplish. So this is really magnificent. Um, that's one of the main things I, I mentioned in the, in the new film as well, um, it, towards about the middle or I guess uh, towards the end of the film, really, I... Uh, there are a lot of people who who have approached a lot of this research and information before me, and and a lot of the uh, this stuff has been covered in other ways. But it always, up to this point, has been covered and and researched, as you mentioned, coming from the standpoint of an agenda, whether it's for you know the Christians to to help strengthen and sort of justify their own existence, or whether it's um, you know neo Nazis and white supremacist groups thinking that it you know proves why they are and indeed the, the master race. And all this yeah, crazy stuff. and so I mean, and and, and, and believe it or not, the I'm Palladians. not kidding you. I'm not kidding. No, I mean, I'm not even. I'm not even being funny. There, there actually is. There actually is a guy. I don't want to say his name, but there actually is a guy who's gotten into a lot of the ancient America um, stuff, and he's written a lot of books on. It, and I actually read one of his books on my show. Uh, I'm glad I did, but it was before I knew that he is actually a real, actual Nazi. He really actually is. And wow. I, somebody sent me this stuff, and I was like, no, come on. This guy, really? No, and I started looking into him. And, oh, sure enough, uh, just a real sick, sick, sadistic past with this guy. I mean, there actually really are these types who believe that, that they, the only reason they want to uncover any of these law secrets is, is to help justify, again, justify their own existence. And I'm not trying to come at this from a standpoint to uh, help back up, you know, religion or science or, you know, white supremacists or any other agenda. The, the simple fact of the matter is the extent of the cover-up of this stuff 
affects the lives of every single person on this planet, whether or not you think it does or know it does or not. And that's really the key component here. And unless we start to see some uh, exposure on some of this stuff that just blows holes in the established dogma of science and religion, you know, we're, we're going to stay in this constant state of, uh, you know, really purgatory and never evolve and never get anywhere. And we're, you know, we're still 50 years from now. People are still going to be griping and wondering why the New World Order is doing this, that, and the other. And really all the while, um, you know, we could have gotten to the end of this if we knew that the, the extent of what we're dealing with is much deeper than bankers and, and all this other stuff. There's a whole spiritual and, and uh, you know, sort of otherworldly, other dimensional end to all of this that um, gets into the realms of scientific stuff that are, you know, science fiction stuff that some people just don't want to believe exists. The paranormal, yeah. And before yeah. we go on to your The Lost Secrets of Ancient America, um, you're in Texas, and there's a lot of alternative media there. I know you mentioned Alex Jones. You have Freeman. I mean, you have all different people coming out of that area. Um, are you connected with any of these people, and how do you feel about um, your uh, – you're uh, being exposed to the, the different alternative media in your area. Like I used to watch a cult round table. I forget what it was, esoteric, a cult round table or something it was called. And uh, Freeman used to have some of those people on his show. And uh, that was like my indoctrination into all this stuff, like trying to understand how it all worked. So um, there's, there's, a, there's a big community there. I think uh, Paul Laffoley and like all different kinds of people coming out of Texas, and maybe you can kind of give us a little overview of what it's like in your area um, for alternative uh, media and alternative uh, information. Oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a dark black hole here. <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a dark, cavernous black hole here in Dallas, Texas for, uh, for alternative research. I mean, it really is. I'm an island here. I mean, I, I, you know, there, you're right. There is, I mean, uh, I suppose there is a, a, a lot of alternative media and type stuff in, in Texas, but only because this is, I mean, we're, it's, it's a huge, it's bigger than some countries, man. I mean, this is a huge place. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the distance, I mean, if, 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 if you've never been from Dallas, say in a car from Dallas to Austin, Texas, if you've never been in a, in a, in, in a car on that four hour trip, you don't even know how much just sheer open space there is between here and there i mean and you're talking about you know four hour distance between these cities it's unbelievable but um so no i don't really um i'm kind of a lone wolf kind of always have been kind of always will be i uh i don't really um uh you know uh, uh, mingle with a lot of the other truther people out there freeman you know i'm cool with freeman i've been cool with freeman for a long time I actually um I got actually got him his radio show back on Oracle. I was one of the founders of, of Oracle Broadcasting back in 2008, awesome. and uh, I actually gave Freeman his his radio show there. Got him and gave him his show. And his his intro, if you ever heard his show, when it was back when it was on, uh, and he had the uh, "Come on and take a free ride," yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and oh, you hear yeah. that that's me. That that voiceover oh is God. me. Oh my God, that's so yeah. cool. Yeah, <laughs> I made that. I, I actually made that inter, that that uh, that intro for him when when we started the show. Yeah. So uh, yeah, Freeman. You know, I haven't seen Freeman or talked to him in a few years, but uh, he and I have always been cool, and we've seen each other in a few events through the years. And he's yeah, he's a real nice guy, and he's really the real deal. Uh, if you're anybody out there is wondering, he's not. You know, he is the real deal, guys. I've met him before. He's he's re <laughs> he really is the real deal. He's he's just like he is. You know, and you see him. Out early, no, he's 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 a really great guy and really sweet, and, and I like him a lot. But you know, I I don't really uh, uh, mingle with other uh, other conspiracy types or or true the types at all. I really just you know um, focus doing on uh, my work on my own. You know, there's a lot of awake people and a lot of aware people here in Dallas in this area to this type of information. I mean, I I know tons of them here. There are tons of enlightened people here that are not just um, you know dumb hicks and rednecks and stuff. But it, there's just not a lot of people here um doing anything about it really and you know some of the groups i, I actually founded the 9 11, the first 9 11 group that was ever in dallas uh, i started that and left that because it became 
something other than what it should have been about. You know, I don't really want to go into any more details other than that, but it no, just, well, you know, yeah. Yeah. it just became something that it was it shouldn't have been about. So I just didn't feel comfortable being involved with it anymore. The but nine eleven truth movement has uh, had so many splits and divisions. I mean, I had people yeah. that I I was in the original email group for the nine eleven scholars. Yeah. And um and and when they they broken up so many times and split off into, into different entities and um people that I've been friends with for years are like, you know, still fighting over whether there was planes or no planes and it's like <laughs> Well, okay, whatever it is or it isn't, you know, it still is, there's a problem here. They've moved on to a million other things since you then, know? too, you know, that's the yeah, thing. Yeah, it's like, like let's, let's, let's put everything on the table and let them sort it out. But, you know, we, we, we have evidence, you know, why don't you just move forward with evidence, you know, just throw it all on the table. To let them try to figure out what's right or what's wrong, you know, if you're going to take it in a legal sense or whatever. Just keep putting the information out there. That's the most important thing. And I remember um, I told my sister, like, I tried to tell my family, and I said, well, in 10 years. And it was amazing, like, almost exactly 10 years. That's when things started really breaking. I think it was like a spell, and people started opening up and started to, like, breathe and, and come together and realize there was other people around that, um, you know, other uh, news uh, programs, alternative media and alternative documentaries, were, you know, wasn't our only – connection we were actually connecting with individual people so and i think that's what makes your work so pure is that you did remain by yourself and and you you know kind of went on your own you blazed your own trail in in making your documentaries and that's what makes them so fresh and and you know they're going to be timeless they're they're not really going to be dated um whether the information is known or not there's always going to be people who are going to you know click on your one of your videos and say wow is that true how can that be true <laughs> you know and it's already like we would like to think that a majority of people understand these things are real and this is what's really happening but we have no uh, no way of knowing that people are going to let go of their belief systems you know p uh, people will will believe in what they believe as long as it it works for them and well, you mentioned something. You know, I, I want to mention something because you, you, this is the second time you sort of caught on the on those lines. And there's something very important in there you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, the, the sort of information driving people crazy. And and yeah. I find, you know, I, I find that it's kind of like, well, have you ever noticed, Chrissy, that that you know, certain people, if they do drugs or alcohol, they're they're, they're somehow they're okay and they don't ever get crazy or do anything. But other people who maybe were kind of little off before, you give them just a tiny bit of drugs or alcohol and it's like fuel on a fire they are just all over the place you know that that's sort of an analogy that works well for this type of information i find people that are um you know pretty together already tend to uh, absorb this stuff and take it in and 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 really understand it a lot more people who are already you know a little off from the world and look i mean the world will make you crazy regardless of whether you're crazy or not this world can make you crazy and you know, when you have somebody like that who's already maybe a little off and maybe a little not all there, and then you start piling on Building 7 stuff on them, and, you know, you start <laughs> piling on, you know, all the conspiracy stuff and, and uh, secret societies, it just it becomes too much for them, and they either shut down completely or they, you know, they just fly off and do something stupid. It just it, – it's what I find that is that I think it's – I, you know, as much as I hate to say it, it kind of does, you know, in a weird, strange and kind of sick, twisted way. It does sometimes sort of weed out people who aren't going to go the whole way anyway. And, you know, that, that oftentimes that's not a bad thing. I mean, it sounds bad, but that's a good way to look at it. That's really positive. <laughs> there, are, you, there, you know, because you don't want those people. They're not going to go all the way anyway. And, and you, you, once you get to a certain point of understanding of this stuff. There's not going to be any turning back for you. And many of you out there listening may already be at that point. And, you know, you may have some of these people who can't handle the, the how deep it really goes. So they're going to get to a point and, you, you know, you're just going to lose them because they can't seem to wrap their minds around, uh, you know, again, being open to this stuff. As soon as you say, well, I won't believe that because it doesn't fit in, you know, to my understanding what I believe is possible. As soon as you do that, they got you. Because we're well beyond the realm of believability at this point as far <laughs> as what, you know, I won't believe that's not possible. Well, maybe it's not possible in what you currently believe to be possible based on what we've been programmed with and what we've been told is possible. But 
uh, I promise you the reality of it is well beyond the realms of, poss of possibilities at this point. Absolutely, and, and I, I, that's perfectly said. Um, we have about 10 minutes to the top of the hour, and I was wondering if you wanted to take maybe a little break. Um, I'll put a little uh, music on, and, and you can kind of get yourself situated, and we'll be back at 10 o'clock, and we'll talk about your films. Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. Okay, um, we're going to do a little... Welcome back, Josh. All right, good to be back with you here. Uh, and yeah, the uh, the newest film that I, I just uh, have released, as you mentioned, is the uh, Lost Secrets of Ancient America, Volume One. Uh, if people want to find out how to find uh, my films and my radio show and all that stuff, they can go to my website. It's uh, theglobalreality.com, or they can just go to Google and type Josh Reeves, and my website will be the first one that comes up. And uh, we've got digital downloads of the film there. People can get Blu-ray and DVD copies as well of, of Lost Secrets of Ancient America. And uh, we also have the trailer there for Volume 2, which I'm working on right now. But uh, as I mentioned before the break, that was uh, the, the sort of the genesis of this film was, was this rock wall thing. I had been reading uh, Jim Marr's book in 2004, uh, Ruled by Secrecy. And he mentioned in there this, you know, maybe one day we'll have the answers to this ancient, mysterious rock wall in Rockwall, Texas. And it just... Uh, about knocked me on the floor because I had had experiences growing up um, around that area that were strange, unexplained things, missing time events and strange uh, spiritual energy happenings, UFO sightings, on and on and on. Myself and friends I grew up with and their parents and just a lot of people that I knew. And so, you know, having always kind of wondered about these things and wondered what what, what was out there around that area when I heard about this rock wall thing, I just, something subconsciously in my mind, even though I had no information or data to back it up, told me that somehow whatever this rock wall thing was, it was the answer to these questions that I was, I was looking for answers for. And so, um, as I talked about earlier, you know, progressing through all the other films and doing radio show and stuff, when I finally got to work on this project, um, we shot all of, uh, all the stuff on location in, um, Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, um, we went to Alabama, Mississippi, we went to several states, and uh, we're going to even more for this uh, this new film, Volume 2. And I came from the standpoint of trying to make a film about the rock wall, and then upon trying to find, okay, you know, were there other things like this and other places in the United States found, is there any kind of other precedent for this? It led me into uh, this much deeper area of research and finding out that there's a whole history of cultures and civilizations that have been known about for long periods of time, thousands of years that were even older than that in North America, long before the Native Americans or, or colonial Americans or anything else. And that's, um, that's really what this first volume one of this film really gets into. We get into a lot of the stuff about the rock wall. And if you don't know what the rock wall is, um, it's a uh, structure that is under the town, the small um, bedroom community. It's a suburb of Dallas. And um, buried under this town is a 20 diameter wall made of all these strange minerals like um, zircon, garnet, um, titanite, brookite, tourmaline, stuff we use to make alloys, rare earth metals, all of this. Um, it's leveled at 550 feet above sea level, meaning as the terrain changes, the leveled height of this structure does not change. Um, that can't happen on its own. That can't happen naturally, nor can these materials that these cast stones that are held together with a strange quartz geopolymer substance, these can't occur naturally in nature either. And I'm going to be doing a... Uh, live presentation on all this stuff coming up in September, September 29th in uh, in Houston, Texas. And so uh, I'm, I'm going to be showing on hand there the examples of the various minerals that are found in the rock wall and showing to people how they form naturally in nature because they have a certain set of um, conditions that these minerals have to form in. And they do not form this way and are not formed this way in rock wall. Somehow in these rock wall stones, they are crushed up into a uh, substance that bricks have been cast out of and somehow with a technique unknown to us today it, with modern technology 
somehow, because most of the time if you take materials, specifically minerals and stuff like this, and you start mixing them together, the molecular structure of these individual minerals will always bond and always create uh, a new substance. Here in the Rockwell stones, they don't. They remain independent in situ in the stones, even though they don't form naturally on... Together. Yeah, together. Because, well, for example, uh, tourmaline only can form naturally in nature on quartz. That's how it forms. In the Rockwell stones, you have absolutely zero quartz. But yet, to make a 20-mile diameter structure, you would have to have had millions of tons of leftover quartz. Where did the, all the quartz go? that they met, uh, had left over when they made these bricks. Well, they that explains why when the analysis was done on this strange mortar that holds the rock wall stones together, it was found, the scientists were confused because they couldn't figure out why this, it, they figured out it was a geo, what they called a geopolymer mortar made from three different types of crystals, uh, quartz crystals that were brought from different locations. And that explains exactly how we know this is not a, natural formation as the Smithsonian Institute deemed it in 1927, which, uh, by the way, has not been challenged uh, all the way up till today, that stayed scientifically intact because no one wants to challenge it. But the fact of the matter is uh, the quartz geopolymer substance is absolutely the proof that these stones were cast. And uh, I, I have actually located the quarry. I have located the place where these stones, where the materials came from. And we talk about that in volume one of the film as well. And we're going to be getting more in depth into that in uh, in volume two but there's uh there absolutely is a cover-up going on to keep this stuff uh hidden from the general public and the reason that is simply people always ask me that question more than any other why would they want to keep this covered up mm -hmm. and simply the fact of the matter is is that it absolutely destroys all previously established narratives for the history of mankind the history of humankind, and it also smashes, you know, the whole dogma of, uh, you know, fundamentalist Christianity of the earth is 7,000 years old and all this stuff. It, it smashes science. It smashes religion. It smashes the entire fundamental basis of their narrative of world reality up to this point, and that's why they want to keep it covered up. Yeah, and um, I would be interested, too, to find out if you had um, taken any additional steps to find out more information from the Smithsonian um, because a lot of the— uh skulls and and different information is being locked up in there as far as we know that um you know they're 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 keeping this information they're keeping it for themselves but they're not sharing it with the rest of the world like uh, the vatican you know and that runs and the interesting thing about that is is that it, it that runs absolutely contrary to the reason why the uh the smithsonian, the smithsonian was set up exists. in the first place right, yeah absolutely. john smithson um who actually was a, was a Freemason as well. He set it up originally as it was supposed to be um, a repository of relics and, and knowledge and everything else so that people in the future, when mankind had progressed to a state of greater understanding than was available at that present day and age, um, we would have a context, more of a context than we did then of what these um, ancient relics and things were, were trying to tell us. And that is indeed absolutely why they wanted to cover it up. So after his death, they turned the Smithsonian Institution into a repository of knowledge and information that would be withheld from the general public, not shared with the public. And a lot of people don't know this. One of the most common um, misconceptions, it was a misconception I had as well, because that's the way they present it to us. But when you research this, you find out the Smithsonian Institution itself is not actually a, a federal government controlled institution it's it is private. actually a it is actually an outside funded institution that's funded by uh, european interests european banker interests uh it's uh, uh, interests out of rome out of, yeah, as you mentioned the vatican but the where they confuse it is is the museums the smithsonian museums in the smithsonian stuff that you go visit in washington dc the museums themselves are controlled by the federal government and they are are, are taxpayer funded but that's the museums. That's not the institution itself. But they confuse that in the minds of the general public so that the general public believes that, you know, this is it's all one in the same. Yeah, it's all one in the it's same. Not. And it absolutely isn't. The, the Smithsonian has offices in almost every country in the world. And the reason they do is so that any time any new discoveries are found, they can get their people out first to retrieve it or hide it or whatever else they need to do. And it's interesting that the only countries in the world, Chrissy, where the Smithsonian doesn't have offices of people ready to go 
are all the countries that they tell us are the big threats. I mean, let's Absolutely. do the list here. North Korea, yeah. Iran. That's what I was thinking about Iraq, uh, how they looted the museums. That was the first thing they did you know, the when they attacked, bit. and uh, yep. they took all the major uh, artifacts. They just they knew where to go. They knew what they were looking for, and they took the most uh, valuable information-packed uh, items and well, the interesting Still. thing that that they, that, I, that they took that really interests me the most, as you mentioned, they uh, there's BBC footage of this. It's unbelievable. I've seen it. They uh, they they actually show these guys. I mean, their faces. They show their faces and everything. It's I mean, special forces went in. They mm -hmm. blew the door off with C4. And the thing is, they had all sorts of the replicas out in the regular uh, uh, part of the museum. These guys went blew right past the replicas. They knew which ones were replicas and which ones weren't. They went right to the vault. And when they blew the doors off the vault, what was in the vault was these uh, were all the Sumerian, Sumerian uh, clay tablets, Sumerian uh, cylinder seals, strange artifacts depicting uh, reptilian humanoids that go back to the Ubaid period, which actually predates Sumeria. But on top of all that, there were thousands and thousands of – this is what struck me when I saw the footage – was that there were thousands of gin bo genie bottles, gin bottles, mm. uh, going back to the Babylonian period, many of which disappeared. Now, the reason why those were in that vault is because some of these supposedly, um, actually all of them, supposedly contained Jeez. spirits, <laughs> demons, spirits that had gin. been captured in these going back to Babylonian times. They had them going from Babylonian times all the way up to the present. They had them from all periods in there. Now, where did those come? Well, you just when you're talking about it, I kind of giggled, and I'm thinking about the Nazis. What the Nazis did went around looting all these different countries. <laughs> they, they were, they were they doing were the same thing. The same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, oh, my God, but, history repeats, you know? But what they were what they were looking for and what and what they were accessing it, what they were trying to find were was really this the, the same things I mean it, it, play, uh, not Plato but uh, um, oh uh, F uh, Sir Francis Bacon you know his mm. book the New Atlantis uh, he talks specifically about there being this uh, New Atlantis you know in the West built on the Atlantis of old he talked about there being flying machines and skyscrapers they knew that there was an ain't, there was some, something lost here that would be found by people in the future that would give whoever found it uh, great power and strength. And, and that's the thing about the rock wall that when I think about that strikes me the most because the strange thing about this 20-mile this diameter rock wall structure is that with the crystalline makeup that I mentioned earlier, it causes this wall to produce piezoelectrical energy currents that respond to frequencies. Um, meaning when you hit this wall with certain low frequency vibrations, low fr frequency fields, it starts to shake and oscillate and roar. It makes huge roaring sounds and produces an electric current. Uh, they, they had a, a backhoe digger on this thing last time they had done a dig in the late 90s, and uh, the low frequency oscillation from the engine caused the entire 20 mile diameter wall to start shake and vibrate and producing electrical currents, uh, and they had to shut the engine off because the the uh, backhoe was shaking like it was about to take off into the air. Wow. Uh, and this thing seems to be some sort of either, I think it was either some kind of a launching pad or some sort of uh, electrical energy grid thing, but also a structure. And that's why a lot of the information definitely points in the direction of this thing being uh, what would people would consider an Atlantean civilization and uh, the reason is is because when, at the bottom of this thing when they started excavating down they started finding sharks teeth embedded all on the outside of the wall and there was also uh, fresh sand dollars at the bottom when you cracked them open they had fresh medium now this is this is north texas there hasn't been ocean here in a long long time from yeah. what they tell us mm -hmm. uh, so why why was the why were these sand dollars uh why were they still fresh? Well, the reason it was is that this is what the soil analysis on the rock wall tells us. Uh, there was a catastrophic event somewhere in the area of the um, Gulf of Mexico about 11,000 years ago, 11,000 between 11 and 12,000 years ago, that uh, caused all of this overburden and material to come up over the wall and cover it very quickly 
in a catastrophic event. This is what we know as uh, the flood stories that all, I mean, we've got civilizations going back long before the Bible, long before any of these other cultures that uh, all have deluge stories. And uh, this is what the soil analysis of the rock wall shows conclusively, that in that time period, there was a catastrophic event that covered this thing. So when you start digging down to the bottom of this, because this soil and all this overburden uh, covered the wall so quickly and in such a short amount of time. It was time, like her hermetically sealed. It was absolutely because it was absolutely hermetically sealed. It sealed the water, all of that soil way down there, seven stories to the bedrock, sealed all of that stuff up. So when it started being pulled out, it was like it was just pristine. It was wow. just in there. And uh, being it's situated on the 33rd degree parallel line and, uh, you know, after the flood, we had the rise of civilization again that appeared conveniently after the flood, right on the 33rd degree parallel, yet again in Babylon, where you started having these, uh, the first messianic deity, Oanes. Uh, this is why the, this is really, he was really the proto, the proto Jesus. And this is why the Pope has the fish hat to this day. Uh, he came up and had the same stories of, you know, put no other gods before me and could walk on water and all these stories. And I get into that extensively in the film. But um, we, we start to see this connection between the 33rd degree parallel and uh, the, the sites where a lot of these materials for the rock wall are located. A lot of these tourmalines and, and rare metals are only found in places like uh, Pakistan. There's a mine there where some of them are found. It's smacked up on the 33rd degree parallel. There's another mine in Afghanistan where some of these rock wall materials are found. Uh, it's smacked dab on the 33rd degree parallel. And all along the United States, uh, along the uh, 33rd degree parallel from the East Coast to the West Coast, you have ancient sites, mound sites, petroglyphs depicting strange alien creatures all along this line. And then you have this wall um, situated just short of that. And um, it, it really, really starts to become apparent that this technology that they're searching for might very well be uh, located or be a part of this rock wall thing. I mean, L3, who is a division of Air British Aerospace, they're the second biggest outsourcer to the CIA and the Pentagon in the United States. They built their offices in Rockwall right smack dab on top of part of the wall. Wow. And uh, the, the famous channeler, uh, Ashiana Dean, was asked about the rock wall, and uh, this entity that she channeled said that it was a storehouse of technology after the fall of Atlantis. And so many things have come into play that really seem to make that be, be really true, considering you have this huge military contractor building offices there. I mean, it could be, very well could be possible that there is some sort of underground structure containing ancient technology. The reports out of the Rockwell newspaper in the late 1800s detail underground subterranean chambers where they found the abode of a giant. Other uh, reports talk about two black marble pillars that shone like something from the Orient. This fits the description identically of the pillars of Hercules uh, or the pillars of Solomon that were two black marble pillars that were carved by Enoch during the Atlantean age that had the laws mankind were supposed to follow. I mean, there was a report of these being seen, something like this, very similar to this being seen underneath Rockwell. So all of these things continue to, to add up and come together where we start to see, especially the Sumerian king list information where it talks about this uh, 432,000 year reign and uh, right at the 230,000 year mark or so is when they started building these eight cities that these Anunnaki gods ruled over for 432,000 years prior to the flood. There was a strange garnet, two and a half ton garnet stone found near the rock wall that had a hieroglyphics on it no one had ever seen before. And uh, it since has disappeared uh, supposedly into the hands of a prominent um, rock wall congressman, uh, supposedly Congressman Ralph Hall is who, is who has this thing. What's interesting is the hieroglyphs, a match for these hieroglyphs was found on a coin that was found in a soil strata that falls right into that dating period when these cities were built right at 200,000 years. It was found in a, in a well in Illinois and has the same exact hieroglyphics that this two and a half ton garnet stone has. And the soil strata that it, it was dated in, that it was found in, dates to 220,000 years. This coin was in the, uh, of course, in the uh, possession of the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. The Smithsonian said they had it. They knew where it was and that uh, uh, another rock roll researcher could come and take pictures of it and get video and whatever else. And when he went to go do that, 
they said, oh, well, we're sorry. We actually, we don't have that. We lost it. We don't know where it is now. Right. Uh, but um, this, this hieroglyph, 220,000 years, it was the soil strata it was found at. And again, that matches with this uh, tablet that was in the possession of J.P. Morgan for a period of time. It's now in a museum in Oxford in England. It's called the Sumerian King List, and it details this 432,000-year reign. And I talk about that in the film. Uh, 432,000 appears again and again um, in uh, ancient literature, in ancient texts. There's an importance on that number. So it's very interesting that um, both the soil data, the uh, some of the analysis that's been done with the rock wall stuff, that right in that 200,000-year range, time range, is what we're looking at for the date on the rock wall, and that's what has made a lot of past researchers and people not believe it was a nat it was a um, structure that wasn't natural because of how old it is, and uh, this you know not knowing that there actually you know were people around back then. It's 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 pretty wild. So the rock wall is over two hundred twenty thousand years old. Yes, and uh, the the flood. It's believed that the um the catastrophic event could have been around 11,000 years old, years ago, maybe longer. Yeah, uh, uh, right in about, well, about 11,800 years is what the uh, soil analysis shows. And there are there was actually uh, an article that came out about a month ago that talked about some new evidence they found that, yeah, a, a catastrophic event definitely happened on Earth that caused a flood 11,800 years ago. So uh, we're pretty much in the target range for that. But what what's interesting is, is that the, the rock wall itself was built to last when it was Mm -hmm. built the engineering techniques that were employed in it uh we barely have a grasp on today one of which is this natural buttressing that it has it has a buttressing built into uh the wall that allows it to withstand a live load meaning you could put something on top of it uh mm -hmm. and it could withstand that without without crush that's an engineering feat a niobium which is one of the elements found in there we didn't even know about niobium until the early 1800s and we use it today in uh uh, well, we use it in pipelines, we use it in jet engines, rocket engines, we use it in big hadron colliders like CERN, uh, magnetic resonant, resonant imaging systems, MRIs, we use all of that, uh, you know, niobium for that. And the reason we use niobium in those things is because it's a great conductor, number one, and it can, when you use it in combination with other materials, it can make all your other materials withstand heat at greater temperatures than it could on its own. This is another reason why we know, talking about 9-11 earlier, this is why we know that those indestructible cores of those buildings could not have collapsed or been evaporated into nothing from just jet fuel and other parts of the building because the steel of those uh, indestructible cores of the World Trade Centers were reinforced with this element called niobium. Niobium we get from a, another element called columbite, and you have to extract mass amounts of it out to get this. But what it does is it reinforces your uh, steel or whatever materials you're going to use. And uh, it not only acts as a conductor, but also keeps high, high levels of heat from getting beyond uh, usable air temperatures. Meaning even if that steel were to get into the 3,000 degree or 4,000 degree heat level, the steel at the World Trade Centers would not have collapsed or just evaporated into dust. The only thing that could have caused that to happen <laughs> was a chemical, is a oh chemical God. reaction. When you want to extract this niobium from the columbite, it's a chemical process to do it. It's the same thing whenever you're cleaning any sort of, of rock off of another type of matrix. You take a chemical solution and it eats away the stuff you want and uh, you don't want and leaves the stuff you do want there. So undoubtedly, a chemical reaction of some sorts uh, regardless of what you b believe about 9-11, is absolutely scientifically the only thing that could have eva evaporated those cores into nothing. And somehow, whoever built this rock wall, the person, the engineer who built this, knew that if they used this um, niobium in with the rest of these materials, that they could get a much more uh, stable effect, especially with the, th the whole thing of it being a conductor, because that's key especially because this, the rock wall itself produces a strange magnetic field, a electromagnet, it produces an electromagnetic field, but it doesn't produce any sort of magnetism. Like you can put a magnet, and there's no magnetite in it. You can put a magnometer on it, it won't do anything. But if you try to go up near that thing with certain devices, it'll just fry them. Wow. So, so that the, uh, the, what we see here is that 
again, there was a level of sophistication of engineering that uh, went into the building of this that's beyond anything that, that we could do today just strictly because so much of the materials that are found in this thing are, I mean, we consider them to be precious and semi-precious stones. The, the price would be ridiculous, but if price and money was no object to you and you could build whatever you wanted to build out of whatever materials you could find, you know, price be damned, you would use those type of materials for one reason and one reason alone because they withstand the, the test of time. When you combine all those into the rock wall stones, you have a stone that has a hardness that is almost, it, it's about one Mohs scale less than a diamond. A diamond being 10, you've got something here that's about a nine. It's harder than any granite that we have or that's known to mankind. And it's absolutely an artificial creation. And uh, the, the fact that this stuff was built to last definitely shows us why there's such a cover-up. Somebody in the distant past knew that somebody in the future would uncover this and it would give a lot of power because if, if it's true what a lot of other researchers have shown, that there was some ancient worldwide energy grid that went along these ley lines and these ancient sites and many of these mound sites I visited for the film are along these ancient sites as well and they're all aligned to the equinoxes and the solstices and they're all aligned to Cygnus and all these other same strange celestial locations. Some sort of worldwide energy system, energy grid that gave power to all people of the world for free existed in ancient times. And if that came out right now in our day and age, it would bring about the end to the tyranny in which we exist in, period, end of story. Well, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, but like we talked about in the beginning, um, most people will hang on to their dogmas and, and they're not going to let go. <laughs> and unfortunately, yeah, it, I think it's even being predicted that there is going to be a split. There's going to be like the haves and have nots. There's going to be people who are open to this information, are open to the changes that are taking place and will be taking place. And there's other people who are going to be steadfast in their old belief systems and, and they're not going to budge. And it's going to be really hard to reach them. And, and it's going to, I, I don't want to say a war, but it's, you know, um, I think when uh, the first Bush election uh, for the Bush the Lesser, I call them, um, I, I, heard, I listened to people talking and they, they actually called the, uh, the, the, the fight between the Republicans and the Democrat a war because people couldn't come together. People were so divided. And I, and I think that that's kind of what we have, even though we have this explosion of openness and people willing to listen because they see so much, uh, what is it, abuse in, uh, in government today and they, and they see the hypocrisies. But I, I still think that uh, as far as religion and science even is concerned, there's going to be, <laughs> they're going to be real hard pressed. I know, I know uh, biologists, microbiologists and I know philosophers that are, are well-established people in their field that, you know, they, they can't even apply quantum physics to, like, to the macro level. They think it only works on the quantum level. They don't, they don't see that it applies to all life, you know, to, from, you know, from quantum to the, to the farther vast of the universe. Yeah, universal absolute. Yeah, and they, and they don't get that. They, they just can't grasp that. And these are, like, these are intelligent people. They're not dumb <laughs> i mean they're they, they, they understand the, the concepts better than i can but they, but the programming that they've been taught and, and right. the, pro the program indoctrination that they went through to get to where they are is so strong that it's not their fault really they can't break through that absolutely yeah and um and, and more on the rock wall um how about the size of the bricks themselves i mean um what's the dimensions uh for the individual bricks well, that's a good question because it varies. Why it varies widely, and we really have such a small um, amount of data. My, you know, one of my main goals is to have a is to get, have a, a a rock wall dig conducted, a current one, because we need to have all this stuff that a lot of the stuff I've talked about here tonight. We need to have it documented. You know, the shaking of the bulldozer and mm -hmm. all this stuff. It needs. I, my plan is to have a, a new dig conducted and have all this stuff, every step of it documented for a future film of mine so that people can see all this stuff and really the truth of the rock wall for themselves. So because we only have data from really a couple of different digs, um, we, we don't really have the complete answer for how big the stones are. All I can tell you is, is they vary widely as far as in some places they seem to be uniform in shape and in other parts of the wall, 
they seem to be not uniform in shape. And for example, um, no one's actually gone all the way down to the bottom bedrock of it yet. They've gone down pretty far, but no one's actually gone all the way down to the bottom yet. But what they have discovered is, is that the deeper that you dig, the larger and older that these stones become. And up towards the top, there seems to be some larger type stones up towards the top that don't seem to be near as old. And as you look at the layers of this thing, you can definitely tell that um, there were some renovations done to it through the years. There was additions made to it through the years because uh, you can see that, uh, especially in some of the, the newer, shall I say newer layers, you know, a couple thousand year old layers, um, there are building materials that are not the same building materials as were employed in the rest the of the wall. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. These, these, they were just taking whatever they could find and they were adding on, either doing repairs or adding on to it. But there was definitely, um, there's definitely evidence that it was used for a variety of structures. I mean, a variety of purposes, meaning whatever it was originally built for, I think varied greatly from what it eventually was used for, probably as a structure and as a dwelling. I mean, they found um, a tunnel that went from what they call this temple do rock line dem temple dome room that no one's ever been able to go in yet that lies underneath the old uh, courthouse in Rockwall, Texas. Uh, they found a tunnel that goes all the way down to the Trinity River, which is, is a few miles away. Someone had built an underground tunnel where they could go and get fresh water and bring it back up to the top of the hill to this rock line temple chamber uh, without being seen. So wow. this led to a lot of uh, speculation that, well, were they hiding from these giants? You know, were they, were, were they trying to hide from someone? Were they, who are they trying to not, you know, be seen by? Um, and, it, you know, again, it brings up more questions than there is answers. But it, we, definitely, we definitely know that um, at all the different digs that have been conducted up to this point, we have seen a, a big, big-time uh, variety of stones from stones that maybe – um, well, let's see, uh, some of the average stones I think we've seen, if you go to the old Rockwell Courthouse in downtown Rockwell, they've got a little, um, some stones that came from a 1976 dig that they did, and they've set them up outside the old Rockwell Courthouse and just thrown, um, they didn't have the real, it has some of the real mortar on it on the outside where you can see it, but they just threw concrete together and stacked these things up, and you can, so you can kind of go and see what the actual stones look like, but these are probably about, oh gosh, I'd say anywhere from two and a half, three, three and a half feet long, maybe about, um, 10, 11, 12 inches thick. And, but they vary in size up to that. I mean, some of them are, are on up to three and a half, uh, four and a half tons in weight. Uh, it's a very, very heavy stone because all the materials that it's made out of are very, very heavy on their own, uh, being precious and semi-precious stones. And, and that's the other thing that the mortar substance I mentioned earlier does. When they start digging out these stones, they notice that when it's exposed to air, it starts to grow and expand because oh. this it's, a, it's an absolutely watertight seal um, mortar, and so that that's what a lot of people believe. Well, this obviously this was some kind of a seawall, and the whole Atlantis thing kind of figured in a lot more there because they could definitely tell that it was built on the edge. The ocean came right up to the edge of this thing uh, in whatever time period it was built, and the uh, foundation stones. They said that some of the foundation stones supposedly were built when they were built. They were built in three and a half feet of seawater when they were constructed. Yeah, and just give us a perspective about where is uh, Rockwall, Texas, in in uh, relation to the ocean coast. Uh, well, you're talking about four and a half, five hours, so uh, south. So you're you're talking, you know, four or five hundred miles uh, south, north Texas. If you look on a map, uh, yeah. Dallas and Fort Worth and in Rockwall is in the area of North Texas, which is in the uh, it's not on the Panhandle part, but it's in the the uh, uh, sort of the middle top area, right or uh, south of the Oklahoma border, and then so you right know, in the center, huh? Or yeah, more to the uh, to the east. Yeah, it's a little more east, eastern than central. And you've got the 33rd degree parallel runs right through there, goes all the way out to Roswell, runs all the way out, uh, all the way to California around the Earth, and then uh, you can just go type 33rd degree parallel into a search engine and look at all the pl the locations um, on Earth where the 33rd degree parallel lies. And, and excuse me, and then go look at uh, where some of these minerals that I named that are found in the rock wall are found. That'll blow your mind just on its own. <laughs> Absolutely. That's um, yeah. And um, before we go on to uh, your current research, I thought it would be important for maybe uh, we could discuss 
um, solutions with what is being envisioned to see this research continue. So uh, uh, what can you do or what can we do to help to, uh, to move this forward so that we can uh, do some further digging and do some further research and get some more um, information out there to the public, you know, concrete uh, firsthand? Well, the, the most important thing we're trying to do first, you know, for the longest time I was trying, I was kind of putting my um, uh, my priorities towards getting a dig done first, and really I've changed my prior priority on that now. The, the most important thing that that you know, and this I don't know how much this costs. I know it costs a lot of money, probably in the in hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. But the most important thing is to get lidar data established in Rockwell first for the for the strict number one reason is it's never been done. And if it has it's never been released to the public. And what this uh, LIDAR does, it's been used now in several locations in an archaeological standpoint, and they have located deep buried uh, cities that have never been discovered before because what LIDAR does is it shoots a, LIDAR, uh, a laser beam down from uh, an aircraft and bounces the signal back up, and it allows you to see a 3D topographical image of everything underneath the surface and allows you to move terrain and trees and houses and buildings whatever else off of the picture and see in 3d everything that's under there so if we had lidar analysis done at rockwall we would be able to for the first time have an actual 3d image in a map of how big this thing is what it actually looks like where the locations of it are set at and then if well, once we have that established it would be a hop skip and a jump to find a piece of property or an area where uh, a dig, a crucial dig, could be conducted, and then we would be a lot better off. Now, as it stands now, we, you know, to find a place to dig, you either have to find somebody who, you know, knows for a fact already they've got some of this on their property, mm -hmm. or you know, you have to go buy some of the made by hand maps, which is really all we have to this point, and then hope you get lucky. So it's a very difficult thing. Uh, so right now we're trying to do that. We're also trying to get volume two. Uh, of the film off the ground. People can go to my website, theglobalreality.com, or just type Josh Reeves into Google. They can go there and um, they can make a donation at my website or they can um, uh, buy one of our films, whatever else they want to do there and help our work. And they can send me a uh, uh, personal message as well at my email, globalrealityshow at gmail.com. You can also just go to the contact uh, button at my website and email me there. But, you know, if you want to help out these projects, if you can help us out financially or uh, however else you you can do it, um, that's where you can contact me at. We're also getting ready to launch a new, um, I'm getting ready to launch a new television uh, channel, online TV channel really soon called museontv.com. And we're going to be having um, uh, weekly video uh, shows up there. And I'm going to be doing um, live updates and, and stuff. So, you know, oftentimes when I'm out shooting in the field for these films, we find new information and then, you know, it takes a while for you to get it out into a film because films are very difficult to make and take a long time to make and I'm just a one-man operation so mm -hmm. um, and can you spell that too Museon Museon M-U-S-E-I-O-N TV dot okay. com it. it's not quite it's not up yet the website's not up yet but we're going to be launching that sometime in the next two weeks um, and uh, we're going to have it, the Museon was the name of the uh, library in Alexandria in Egypt where mm -hmm. all of the uh knowledge of all things arts and so this this is kind of going to be a little departure away from uh just the conspiracy or truth or stuff for me we're going to be having shows on museum that encompass um all things i mean we're going to have a um a yoga and a reiki a reiki uh show on there we're going to have just all kinds of stuff that gets into uh a whole variety of things where people can come and, and get information get it very quickly in a video format uh, away just from just the audio and the film stuff. I'm really just trying to branch out and, and get information to people um, in, in a manner as quickly as we possibly can because some of the stuff that comes out, you find it so um, uh, just so off the cuff. You know, it, sometimes you just can't wait to present it into a film. You know, you've got to get it out there now. And so I think that's going to give us uh, an outlet. But like I said, you know, I'm just, I'm a one man person and I, you know, I run my radio show on my own and I don't have a, a outside, you know, corporate sponsorship or outside. Uh, sponsorship from universities and everything else. You know, I'm a one-man person here. Hold on, and, Josh. We're getting some kind of feedback. I'm not sure. Go ahead. Try it again. And, uh, yeah, let, I'm just, let, still let, me, um, let me try to call you right back. We're getting some kind of uh, really crazy feedback. We'll call you right back. Okay. Still doing it? Um, it? It could be my headphones. I'm not sure if it's coming over across the radio. But, um, yeah, um, I don't hear it. 
Okay. Is any, and somebody will let us know if, uh, okay. if it gets really bad. But um, yeah. anyway, that's what I was saying. I'm, you know, I'm a one man operation, and and uh, so everything I do it comes from uh, of the support of my listeners and, and and people who follow me out there. So uh, any contributions people can make towards our work uh, will help us be able to get this film. We're, we're trying to raise right now about uh, two thousand dollars to finish volume two of Lost Secrets of Ancient America. We've already been to five states for this one. We got about six more states to go. We're going to be uh, visiting a lot more sites, the Serpent Mountain, Ohio, the Newark Earthworks, uh, Poverty Point. We've got about 20 more sites to visit. We've already been to Chaco Canyon. Uh, we've been to uh, the uh, Lovelock Caves in Nevada. We've been to um, uh, Lake Tahoe. We've been several places we've already shot at for volume two of the film. And we're going to be getting more into uh, just who these uh, ancient people were, just uh, what connections they have, and uh, further information on the rock wall as well. Okay. Um, so, what is the premise for uh, Lost Secrets of Ancient America uh, Part Two that you're uh, you're really trying to uh, bring out in the in the new film? Well, with this film, we're, we're um, it's it, when you watch Volume One, you, you'll see that we only are able to touch the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and really not extensively get into some of these sites, specifically the Serpent Mountain. We talk about the Serpent Mountain in Ohio a bit in Volume 1, um, but stuff like the fact that it has piezoelectrical interview property, just like the rock wall does, the fact that it uh, depicts this genetic engineering with a, with a sperm entering okay, the... Okay, Josh, I'm going to stop you because um, it's, it's so bad. Nobody can hear what you're saying. Okay. And I'm not sure what the problem is. Um, we tried. Uh, uh, the only other problem, I, the only other thing I could do is reboot the scan. <laughs> I don't see that. I don't. I'm not sure what our options are here. Um, it doesn't seem to be me. It just seems to be on your end, and I'm well, not. I'm not hearing anything on my end, so I don't know. It's just real choppy. If you if you went to the website, you'd hear it in a minute. Um, and you're giving us some really cool information, and I, I don't want anybody to miss it. So, uh, well, why don't you just why don't we just try to do it? Why don't we just try to finish it up another time? Oh, cool! I would love that. I would love that. We can do that. Awesome. We can do it next week, or we do it another time. I mean, just just you know, send me an email, and we'll just finish up and do, do oh, finish it awesome. up another show. Because I'm I'm, I'm open to do it. So I've got I've got one tomorrow, but I don't have any more for uh, a couple of weeks after that. So just send me an email. Okay. Well, we can do the same time next week. How about that? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, that'd be awesome. All right, Chrissy. Thank you, Josh. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.